Over the last few months, I've had, uh, along with uh, a big team of colleagues from our office, including Kenneth Garcia and Brenda Diaz and Barbara Lamb, the chance to work alongside our colleagues at AECOM and the County Parks Department and several other consulting firms on the work you're gonna to get to see tonight. And I can just report to you, it's been a very intense and creative and uh, I think um, motivated process. Jen King, I see that you've joined us and we hit the six o'clock time. Thank you for checking your camera. Jen uh, is the public outreach officer for AECOM and a, uh, a vice president in the company. Uh, AECOM, for those who don't know, is a uh, giant, one of the biggest and most important in the world, uh, multidisciplinary firms. And they're in the lead on creating the uh, project development and environment study that we get to show you some of tonight. Marty P, who's a project manager for AECOM is on the line. And Marty, so could you just uh, briefly introduce yourself? We'll get, you'll get another chance to do it again, but this, for the ones who are already in. Getting my mute to work correctly. Yes, good evening, Victor. Um, uh, my name is Marty Pete. I'm in the Tampa office of AECOM and I'm the project manager for uh, the pd &E study portion of this project. And this has been an exciting and very interesting project to work on. Um, it'll be very important for the people of uh, Miami and Miami-Dade. Looking forward to it. Maria Nardi, I see you found your space in front of that beautiful backdrop of, uh, of the beach and the, and the mangroves or the dune uh, plants and this beautiful blue sky. Would you uh, just check your mic and introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Maria Nardi, Parks Director. It's great to be here, and I'm excited about this meeting. So whenever you're ready, you let me know, and I'll just uh, say a few words. All right. Well, I'll call on you shortly. We're at six o'clock, so we're in the pre-show. And so for those, um, we already have 200 people in addition to those of us from the consultant team and the County Parks Department uh, that are in the hall, more than 200 at this point, more and more dialing in now as we've reached the start time. So for those who just joined us, I'm Victor Dover from Dover Colon Partners. I'm one of the urban designers, part of a big team of people who have been working for you on the future of the Ludlam Trail. And we have a lot to show you. So tonight's meeting will, be, um, it's officially called the public information meeting. It's part of a formal process that's required by law. We'll explain what all that means. But during the meeting tonight, uh, we're going to have from six o'clock to about 6.15, this informal pre-show. We're checking all of our mics. We're getting all of our cameras working. And uh, we'll share a little bit of information about uh, how you can get oriented to the project, where to look for exhibits, where to go for the recording of this of the meeting and some background on the history that brought us here. And then at 6.15 is when we're gonna begin the formal presentation. And this is where we're gonna get into all the technical details. And some of it will be very technical. You'll hear about uh, the uh, environmental studies uh, from everything from endangered species to contamination. Uh, you'll hear about engineering studies, uh, issue, uh, ideas about how the uh, those using the trail on two feet or two wheels or a wheelchair um, will interact with those going by on the crossing streets in, uh, in motor vehicles. So we're gonna, and we're gonna look at pictures. We have some what if illustrations, very early stage here. Uh, uh, several times we'll remind you that this is all draft work and that we are in a very beginning stage uh, where there's a lot of time between now and when we're ready to pull permits and start construction for more public input, including what you leave with us tonight. So we'll make a presentation and then there will be a Q&A session. Now during the presentation, we'll stop a couple of times and hold quick polls. We, you'll use your smartphones. I'll explain how that will work in just a minute. And you'll pick up your smartphone and send a text message to a certain number. And then when we ask a question, you can send another message to that same number and uh, your answers will all be combined and displayed on the screen. Um, so at 6.15, we'll begin that, then uh, we'll have a Q&A session after. When we get to the Q&A session, there's several options for you. You can type your question, comment, or suggestion using the Q&A button in your Zoom window, or you can raise your hand in the Zoom list where your you see your name and uh, ask to be recognized, and we'll create a queue, and uh, we'll go 
go down the list and reach as many people as we can, inviting you to unmute and, and speak uh, into the recording. So um, I, I wanna say, I think if everybody working for you on the Ludlam Trail is ex most motivated about this because it has the potential to make a lot of difference. Um, the phrase I always use about the Ludlam Trail is that it's worth the effort. Yes, it's going to take a lot of work um, and a considerable sum of money to realize the vision for the Ludlam Trail, 5.6 or six miles of it. Uh, but it will be worth the effort. And I think many of us working on this, whether from the specialties of landscape architecture or engineering or urban design mm -hmm. or parks management or uh, transportation planning, uh, we're all especially motivated to make it work well because we feel like this is one of the most important assignments we could ever undertake because of its potential to make people's lives better. Um, most of us on the technical side get to work on projects like this all over the country. And, uh, uh, but I will say here, it's particularly satisfying to work on it because we're local and this is our neighborhood. And we, uh, we, we feel deeply as the neighbors feel about how it will turn out. Every little segment of the trail has been receiving a very detailed assessment and a look at the environmental features, uh, what it will take to, to clean up pollutants, what, how the, the role of the land will work to man, make sure we're managing stormwater, how we can grow beautiful uh, plantings in what essentially will be a transportation corridor, but is also like a linear commons or a, a, a greenway trail uh, that will be shared by all. It's meant for the enjoyment of all three plus million people in Miami-Dade County. It's really a regional facility. And so as we go through the presentation, I want you to remember that there are many moving parts. There's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of different components. And I want you to remember that it's not too late to make suggestions. We have started here. We have drawings. You can assess it now, I think, in considerable detail. But it's not too late to make changes. So we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. In tonight's um, event, one of the things we're, we're going to have a mix here of the visionary parts, you know, the, the, what we imagine this place could be and who and for whom it could make a difference. And, you know, the Ludlam Trail won't belong to any one group. It, it will really be there to be used by people moving about, uh, say, cycling you know, on a bicycle, people walking, uh, people running, people using it to get to a purposeful destination like school or work or uh, to visit the um, a nearby restaurant or a brewery or get to their home, and it'll be used by people who are out for fun and fitness. We want it to be accessible and welcoming to people of all ages and abilities. And the vision will include uh, special places along the 5.6 miles that will vary. You'll have a, a range of experiences you can have along the trail. And we'll talk about what some of those will be. So part of, the, part of what we want to accomplish tonight is to reacquaint people with what we found out about just how good that vision can be, you know, what it will be like to walk on the trail, uh, where there will be occasions where the trail will give you the option to uh, go over a passing street. There are four locations where uh, overpass bridges are imagined. Mm -hmm. We'll look at how it interacts with nearby special public spaces like Robert King High Park or A.D. Barnes Park. We'll look at crossings, not because of course all the crossings won't be overhead. Some of them will be down at grade. We'll talk about how the Ludlam Trail will meet the nearby streets that cross it in 11 different locations. We'll talk about the places where the bikeway and the walking and running uh, paths will be separate and where they will on occasion come together side by side, cross a bridge or cross a street or make room for something in the trail. We'll talk about the landscape. You know, part of it uh, will uh, be shaded with um, shade trees, we would, we would hope. Um, again, assuming that the, the outcome here is that the Ludlam Trail does go forward. Those are the kinds of things that we would hope to see. We we'll probably also see opportunities to restore special landscapes in South, uh, for South Florida. We'll talk about where there is and isn't an architectural ambition for the trail. Now, I'll just tell you now, just spoiler alert, uh, there's no major architecture envisioned. It's uh, nothing with a door, uh, no bathrooms on the greenway parts of the trail because those are already provided in other places. So we'll talk about what will be there uh, in the form of occasional shelters to give you a place to escape the, uh, the sudden and short duration showers we tend to have around here. 
Now, preliminary design work has begun and we're gonna show you the line art. We're gonna show you the colored versions of those. We're gonna show you some of the engineering drawings that we do to see what fits and what has to be how far away from whatever else. Uh, and we'll also talk about timelines. There've been many questions already about that. what is expected to happen first, second, and third as we go forward from here. Um, and so you'll get information about that tonight as well. Marty Pete will summarize for you potential impacts uh, that are assessed according to, again, a strict protocol, engineering impacts, environmental impacts, and sociocultural ones. So that's what we're gonna be doing over the next little while. And I'll, I'll run through this a, a, a couple of times for people that, uh, that are expecting, you know, to need to hear the instructions more than once. We have a lot of people who will join us partway through and you'll hear some of these instructions more than once. So remember the formal presentation will begin at 6.15. Now, the Ludlam Trail sits in a pretty strategic place in our county. It's the Western leg of what we have come to call the Miami Loop, which consists of the Underline plus, which is the, the path under the Metro Rail, plus the Miami River Greenway, which runs alongside the Miami River from downtown uh, west toward the airport. Uh, the anticipated but not yet existing perimeter trail that will someday link the Western end of the Miami River Greenway with the Northern end of the Ludlam Trail. So we're looking today at the 5.6 mile segment uh, that's between those two arrows on this map of the Miami Loop, where the county has bought land or has obtained easements over land that will remain in private hands. Those easements will allow for the trail to continue through the private segments, short segments that remain privately owned. So the trail will be continuous across the, uh, the 5.6 miles uh, uh, if it is realized as imagined. Many of those of you on the call already know this, but uh, just a reminder of two key things here. There's been a very long history of teamwork and collaboration that has led us to this point. And, uh, and frank and difficult conversations at times, but your elected leaders, your our grassroots leaders, organizations like uh, the Friends of the Ludlam Trail, um, and the staff members from the many government agencies involved, have found ways to seek and common ground, get together on an idea, unify, and then move forward to the next step. And what we're doing tonight is potentially one of those next steps. In particular, uh, a member of the Board of County Commissioners, Rebecca Sosa, deserves an, a special call out because Commissioner Sosa has made uh, the Ludlam Trail her mission. She is, uh, when she uh, began to realize the potential of the place and hear from her constituents and those in the other nearby commission districts how important it was to create this space. Uh, she took it on and she's traveled to Washington, to Tallahassee repeatedly. She's uh, gathered up the, all the other leaders at various levels of local, state, and federal government and, uh, and secured commitments. Uh, most importantly for funding, but she's also been there to remind everybody how important this is she's your, um, and, and whom it's meant to serve. So thank you, Commissioner Sosa, for doing that. Now, while the elected leaders and the grassroots leaders were doing their parts and the business leaders were doing theirs, uh, the technicians inside government were also busy and not just recently. As long ago as 1998, the um, the uh, Department of Transportation was doing studies of a potential non-motorized corridor. And again, in 2003, and really most crucially in 2011, a landmark study, an award-winning study called the Miami-Dade County Trail Benefit Study and its Ludlam Trail Case Study uh, were created. And if you've never looked at that document and you're interested in the Ludlam Trail, I strongly encourage you to do it. It's one of the items on the resources tab on the website for Ludlam Trail that the County Parks Department has uh, set up over the last couple of months. And that green arrow points to its executive summary. You can also read the long version, but the Ludlam Trail case study, trail benefits study, will basically go through for you an incredible list of the many different ways this facility uh, would improve the quality of life and economy in our place. You know, after it was concluded that we were going to uh, have a Ludlam Trail somehow, and that a plan needed to be done uh, for what that could turn into, and a way of reconciling what's 
developed by the private developers with a trail going through it. And what remains as Greenway Trail had to be established. And the county uh, uh, planning department uh, under the leadership of uh, studio leader Shalendra Singh conducted not one but two charrettes. Those are big public gatherings with hundreds of people touching the plan, working on maps, imagining what could be. You can see a picture there of Commissioner Sosa meeting with a group of folks who, who were huddled around the map. This went on for days and it, they were, it was done twice. And in the end, a very important map emerged, a map of uh, from one end of the trail to the other of this grand uh, balance between pure park-like greenway trail corridors, which are shown here on this map in green, and the sections in between, short segments of what we now have come to call the development nodes. These are the privately owned areas where buildings will be built and a trail will go between them. We're gonna talk more about what those mean in a little while. But armed with that, your county staff kept working, your county elected leaders kept working. And while there haven't been a lot of public meetings since 2017, uh, a lot has been going on. Those charrettes I described occurred in 2015. Uh, uh, not long after the county amend the, amended the comprehensive plan uh, and then amended the zoning for uh, the area and initiated the study that leads us to what we get to show you tonight. And then most importantly, the county decided to and spent the money to buy the segments that are now in public ownership. And so the Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Department uh, facilitated and accomplished that purchase of land from the railroad. Um, now that uh, led us to where we are now because once they owned the land, uh, the environmental studies began. Some of you know contaminants were found in a couple of places, very normal for a rail corridor where those were used for pest or, or, uh, or plant control. So that will have to be cleaned up. And that's where the fences went up. Uh, on order from the Department of Environmental Resources Management. But those fences won't be there forever if we decide to implement the Ludlam Trail. So I wanna make sure that you're aware that tonight's meeting is being recorded. Uh, and we are gonna have all of this recording available on the website so people can come back, watch it at their leisure. The picture goes by quickly. They can have time to stare at it, take it in and then leave comments. Uh, so on the subject of the website, People who weren't able to join us tonight will want to go look at the recording. So you can check the website later to watch the recording we're making right now. And then, uh, and you can also tell others about it. That website is miamidade.gov forward slash Ludlam Trail. Um, and I'll just say Jen and, and uh, Barbara and Brenda and team, my phone is vibrating a lot. If you need to tell me something like you can't hear me or you can't see or I need to speed up, just unmute and tell me, okay, because I'm not going to bother with that. All right, so that's where you go to look later. Now let's talk about how to participate in the interactive parts of tonight's meeting. In Zoom, uh, your Zoom window has at the bottom a, um, a uh, Q&A button, questions and answers. And so we want you to submit your questions, your comments or suggestions at any time uh, during the meeting tonight using that button, you can type it in. You'll also have the opportunity to raise your hand and ask to be unmuted. Uh, so that you can speak into the record, you can hear your voice. But um, of course, since there are so many people in attendance, well over 300 at this point, and, it's, and the number continues to, to seem to rise, we know we won't get to every question or get to hear every voice. So be sure if you have a big idea to go ahead and type it in, in the Q&A button. Now over to the right of that, there's a chat button. And we, if you can, please uh, just use the chat button for technical issues. If you're having trouble hearing, or the images aren't clear, or you're having a technical problem uh, participating in the poll or what have you, use the chat button and Brenda, Alvaro, and our tech team will help you sort that out. So Q&A for suggestions and comments and chat for technical troubleshooting. Now later we're gonna do some quick polling and you'll use your smartphone. And what we want you to do, or, or an ordinary phone, as long as you have SMS, you know, that is text messaging. You can send a text message. And to get into the poll, you can do this at any time starting now, you'll send a message um, to the recipient by typing the number 22333, like you see at the top of your screen here in yellow, in yellow and black. 
you'll send the message to 22333. And the message you need to send to get into the poll is DoverCole 516. That's our company's code for using this system, D-O-V-E-R-K-O-H-L 516. And once you've done that, you'll be in the poll for the purposes of tonight's conversation. And any additional messages you send to that same recipient will be answers to the poll that are recorded and we'll see the results on the screen. And I'm gonna explain this a couple more times when we get to that spot. At this point, I'd like to check and see if any of our elected officials or representatives are in attendance, their, their representatives are in attendance. Welcome to unmute yourself. Let us know you're here. I will say for all of our elected officials who are watching the recording, thank you for checking on it after the fact. I'll just pause now and see if anybody wants to unmute and, and uh, say hello. Victor. My name is Jen King and I am not an elected official. You are not, but you are. You are just but, as important to us. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I wanted to say, to clarify, if we do have our elected officials in the room to self-identify, I don't believe you can unmute yourself. Please raise your hand. There's a raise hand function. Thank you. I see Mayor Sally Phillips from the city of South Miami is on and she has her mm -hmm. hand up. So I'm gonna, I, you're at the top of my list. Uh, here on my screen, Mayor Phillips. Good Hi, evening, thanks for joining us. Thank you, glad to be here. All right, well, thank you for, for looking in on this. I also see Anna Koshkammer from uh, one of our municipalities down south is on. Um, well, not that, not that south, I'm just Pinecrest. So. Just Pinecrest. <laughs> thanks for having me. We a, a good block and a half away from the <laughs> south end of the Ludlam Trail, thank you. Um, uh, council member for joining us from the village of Pinecrest. Are, uh, are there other electeds that have joined in tonight that we need to join? We need to Hi, Victor. It's Manny Orbis on behalf of Commissioner Sosa. And Manny. thanks for the kind words earlier. Manny, thank you for being here. And thank you to Commissioner Sosa for all the work she's done to make what we've got here possible. Absolutely. And she appreciates all of your work too. And uh, I'll just Keep moving on, but if I've missed anyone, send a message in the chat, and they'll they'll uh, they'll pop in and alert me that I need to stop again. Give another opportunity for that. So at this point, I'd like to turn to Maria Nardi, who's the director of the county's Parks, Recreation, and Open Spaces Department. Maria. Hello, everyone. I'm, let's see. I'm trying to. Um... Uh, see if I can get a screen here, but maybe not, and I'll just talk. Um, just wanted to welcome everyone, um, and uh, thank you, Victor, for uh, facilitating, and here we go. I'm sorry, I can start my video. <laughs> there you here are. We, we see you. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is very exciting for us, and thank you, Victor, for facilitating uh, this meeting and for the work that you are doing. It's been a journey. I think we're making some great progress. And once again, I want to thank the mayor and the Board of County Commissioners with a special thanks once again to Commissioner Sosa, who has been the true champion of uh, this trail. And with her vision, we're moving forward to making it a reality. Uh, of course, as, as you all know, this is a shared trail with two commissioners, uh, Commissioner Sosa and also uh, District 7. Commissioner, former uh, Commissioner Suarez, and now we have the pleasure of working with Commissioner Regalado. So um, a couple of things from our perspective very quickly. This is part of the Parks and Open Space Master Plan that you all, the community, approved 10 years ago for the realization of transforming this community through parks and open spaces. This is part of 500 miles of trails that we have envisioned to build for the community and we are on our way. We've built about 160 so far and this is an important part of that. Uh, we are working with partners. We have been working on this with uh, back in the day with Trust for Public Land uh, to bring this to reality. And this couldn't have happened without the Friends of the Underline and many other groups that have come together to support this project and um, advocate for it. And that's really how all great things happen in communities where people truly care about their parks and public space. So I wanna thank uh, also my team in Parks Department, 
uh, Joe Cornley, uh, Alex Diesel, Alyssa Turtle, Tob, and the entire team, that, um, and Mark Heineke as well, who have worked uh, very hard throughout the many years to bring this to reality. So thank you all for being here, and I look forward to a discussion about the project. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Maria. All right, first a reminder for those who just joined us that this meeting is being recorded. Also a reminder for anyone who didn't get this before, the website is miamiday.gov forward slash Ludlum Trail. And new material has been posted there today and more will go on that website tonight and tomorrow. Uh, so you're gonna to wanna to come back. That, that's your chance to see the exhibits in close detail and you can download items uh, to read reports. You can see the drawings, uh, the images that we show you tonight will be visible there as well. One last reminder, uh, when we, as we go along here tonight, you're welcome to uh, submit questions or comments or suggestions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we will do a quick poll. You can use any phone that can do text messaging um, to, uh, to send a message. And I'll explain how to do that when we get to the, to the poll. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn to Marty Pete, who's uh, leading the charge from AECOM. All right. Thank you, Victor, and uh, I appreciate everyone from uh, the community and the elected officials joining in tonight. This is a very critical part of the of this study and the PD&E process that I'm going to go over. Uh, but first, I'd like to to reach out and thank uh, the partners in this team: uh, Miami-Dade County, uh, the Florida Department of Transportation, uh, Dover Coal, uh, Janus Research, uh, Marlin. Uh, CHP Engineering, uh, GeoSoul, and Caltrans. Uh, this is a group of professionals that have very thoughtfully uh, worked through this process, and I believe that the community at the end of the day will be very, very happy uh, with results. So next slide, Victor. Unfortunately, there is a lag at times going from slide to slide, so bear with us. Um, the presenters this evening, you've already heard from Maria and Victor um, and myself, Marty Pete, there from AECOM. Uh, the next slide. Uh, we will have a series of panelists and subject matter experts uh, that will cover all of the different um, resources and technical expertise areas that we will discuss us and are involved. So when we have the question and answer session, this, this panel will be available to answer specific questions when we get to that. Hopefully much of this presentation will provide answers to your questions, but we will be very happy uh, to answer them in detail as we move on. So the agenda for, the, for this presentation, I will be going over uh, what NEPA and pd &E is, and I will explain what those acronyms are in a few minutes. Uh, Victor will then take over again and go through a poll and some of the future vision of what the Ludland Trail will be. Um, talk about what goes on the, after this process. Uh, have another polling question, and then we'll try to get, we will get to questions and answers after that. Next slide. So the purpose of tonight's meeting is to present you project information that we have accumulated to time, which in, to, to date, which means what, what have we, data we collected, what alternatives have we looked at, what are potential impacts, and also to reach out and solicit questions and input from the community. So in the pd &E process, the project development and environment process, there's a series, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. In the project development process, there are five steps, planning, land acquisition, pd &E, design and construction. And as you can see, pd &E is the middle step of five there with a continuous pattern of public involvement. So there's been a lot that has been done. We are in the middle of the process and there's a lot to be done. Next slide. So NEPA is a phrase or an acronym that you'll hear throughout this presentation. It stands for the National Environmental Policy Act that dates back to 1969. And what this really does is it provides planners and engineers with a decision-making process to plan and move forward with different alternatives and actions that result in the least, the least environmentally damaging actions to move forward. And on the, on the right side of the screen in a moment, We'll talk about the resources that you look at 
that are evaluated in the NEPA process. You have social and economic um, resources such as land use change, uh, potential for relocation, economic impacts, cultural um, features such as Section 4F, which is parks and recreation, historic and rec archeological sites, uh, natural features like wetlands and floodplains and wildlife and habitat areas, and also physical features like noise and contamination and navigation. And then finally, if there are any special designations in a project, those are evaluated as well. Next slide. The next acronym is PD&E, Project Development and Environment. This is the process that the Florida Department of Transportation uses to satisfy the requirements and intent of NEPA. There is a manual that, that is there that shows the, the path and the approach to make sure that everything is done adequately all the way through a certain series of slides that unfortunately I'm going to have to read word for word into the record of this presentation. But this is the process that we're in right now, and it will lead us to uh, the selection of a preferred alternative that will eventually become part of design and hopefully end up in a construction of the Ludlam Trail. Next slide. So within the pd &E process, there's a series of steps. And as you can see, we've outlined here, we're in the middle of the pd &E process. We started, as Victor stated earlier, many years ago, stating really what the purpose and need of the project is. And we've collected data and we've developed some alternatives. And this evening, we're here at the public information meeting to solicit input, answer questions, and move forward. From this, during the 21 days of the comment period will be open, we'll take that information that we glean tonight and use it to refine the alternatives um, to move forward. Those will eventually go into our environmental documents that will get submitted to the Department of Transportation for approval. We'll go to a project, we'll, we'll go to a project public hearing, and eventually we'll end with approval, which will give us location design concept acceptance, which really is the envelope in which design can occur. So here is one of the slides is that I need to read into the record, the NEPA assignment. And that the environmental review and consultation and other actions required by applicable federal environmental laws for this project are being or have been carried out by Miami-Dade County Parks, Recreation and Open Spaces in coordination with the Florida Department of Transportation, FDOT, pursuant to chapter 23 US United States Code section 327 and a memorandum of understanding dated December 14, 2016, and executed by the Federal, Federal, Depart Federal Highway Administration and Florida Department of Transportation. Next slide. Also with this is our compliance statement. This project, this public meeting was advertised consistent with federal and state requirements, which include Section 120.525 of the Florida Statutes, Meetings, Hearings, and Workshops, Section 286.011, Florida Statute, Government and the Sunshine Law, Section 339.155, Florida Statute, Transportation Planning, in accordance with Americans with Disability Act from 1990, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and other non-discrimination laws, 49 uh, CFR Part 24, the Uniform Relocation Assistance and Real Property Acquisition for Federally and Federally Assisted Programs. And then finally, 40 CFR Part, part 1506, other requirements for NEPA. Next. Uh, the non-discrimination policy, the title, title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Public participation for this virtual workshop meeting is solicited without regard to race, color, national origin, age, sex, religion, disability, or family status. Persons wishing to express their concerns about Title VI may do so contacting any of the three persons identified here, and this will be available also in this presentation on the website. Next. This project will not cause any relocation of families or businesses. 
Any required right-of-way acquisition will be conducted in accordance with Florida Statute 339.09 and the Federal Uniform Relocation Assistance and Real Property Acquisition Policies of 1970, com commonly known as the Uniform Act. Next slide. All right, I'm done reading slides. Um, now, let's, let's see where the Ludlam Trail is. This is our project location map. Um, it's approximately 5.6 miles. We start in the north, about six feet, 400 feet south of Northwest 7th Street, and goes down to um, Southwest 80th Street, basically in between Southwest 69th and 70th Avenues. Next slide. Within this corridor, we needed to look and evaluate alternatives, which are known as build alternatives. But part of the NEPA requirement is developing what's called the no build alternative. And this is a project alternative that consists of the existing facility and any minor improvements already programmed that are not specifically tied to the proposed project. This alternative will serve as the baseline for comparison against the various build alternatives. The, you might also hear this um, called the no action alternative or do nothing alternative. It gives us the baseline to compare what potential impacts from the build alternatives are. It's a point of comparison. Next slide. So this is a typical section. A typical section is exactly what it sounds like. This is a a representation of what the Ludlam Trail would typically look like in this configuration. There would be a two direction bike lane separated by a sod buffer and a pedestrian path. This would um, meander uh, east and west along uh, the corridor. The next slide shows another typical section. There are situations where we would maintain if technology catches up to us. It's a little bit of lag, but I think it's- There we go, there we go. Uh, if, if you notice, uh, the, thing, the only thing that's really changed here is that sod buffer um, is removed. There are situations that we need to compress uh, the typical section. You still have bi-directional uh, bike path and the pedestrian path there. Uh, finally, a third typical section would be in a bridge situation, we have six bridges. Four of them would be going over roadways and two of them would be water crossings. Again, we would be maintaining a bi-directional bike path and the pedestrian path. And Marty, I'll just break in here for a second to say yes. to the folks in, at home, if you're not used to looking at engineering drawings or these black and white um, uh, computer drafting things are uh, intimidating or confusing, not to worry because we also we have some illustrative versions of these and some uh, three-dimensional illustrations mm -hmm. that take this technical stuff and translate it into a little bit more uh, realistic depiction so stand by that's coming up yes victor has the nice part of the presentation <laughs> <laughs> So I want to go quickly over the project schedule, where we've been and where we're going. Um, as you can see, the project information meeting there is about a third of the way down. Uh, we've had we at the very beginning we've had public involvement. Um, that's a continuous thing. About the fourth item down is ETDM complete. ETDM stands for Efficient Transportation Decision Making. It is a process that the Department of Transportation does to do early preliminary uh, planning an assessment of a project. It also helps define purpose and need and initiates agency uh, coordination and interaction. The next item there, uh, SHPO concurrence on the CRAS. SHPO is the State Historic Preservation Officer, the State Historic Preservation Office, I'm sorry. And the CRAS is the Cultural Resource Assessment Survey. That was completed in August of 2020. And I will talk about that a little bit later. Moving on from here, um, we will be taking the comments that we received tonight and we will um, use those to help us refine our alternatives, make any adjustments that we need to, incorporate those into our engineering and environmental documents and submit those to the DOT with a targeted public hearing in of March of 2021. 
We will also collect public comment um, during that period and that the, those comments and that information will be integrated into final documents that'll lead us to 30% uh, concept plans and the location design and acceptance uh, in about uh, summer, early fall of 2021. Then we'll step into final design and then finally into construction. Next slide. All right, so as I spoke earlier on the NEPA slide, a uh, series of resources that we took a look at. So one of the first ones that, that I wanna talk about are natural resources. And, coordination with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. A natural resource evaluation report was um, developed and submitted uh, with a finding of not likely to adversely affect threatened and endangered species for either federally or state listed uh, species inclusive of the Eastern Indigo Snake, the Florida Bonneted Bat, and the West Indian Manatee. In addition to this, uh, in, in addition to species, we also looked at wetlands, and there are no identified wetlands within the project corridor that to be impacted by any of the build alternatives. Next slide. Recreational resources, which are covered under Section 4F of the Department of Transportation Act. This gives unique protection to park and open spaces. There are two parks along the corridor, the Robert King High Park and the A.D. Barnes Park, that are next to uh, the proposed Ludlam Trail. Our project would actually provide access to these parks and these will be considered enhancements, therefore bringing benefit to all three recreational resources. Next slide. Uh, cultural resources, this is the cultural resource assessment survey. There are two specific things that we had to take a look at in this project. One was the State Historic Highways. Um, there are two that are within the project corridor. However, this project is in compliance with those laws and requirements. The other one are historic properties, which have various uh, criteria on age and importance and context. Uh, they were evaluated in the Culture Resource Assessment Survey. There were no archeological resources identified within the project corridor, and none of the historic projects properties uh, were deemed to have an effect. This report and this finding was um, submitted to the State Historic Preservation Officer and they concurred with our findings uh, August 27, 2020. Next slide. Uh, contamination Screening Evaluation Report. Um, this is part of the pd &E manual. This is one of the things that there's uh, directions on how to do this. And as Victor alluded to earlier, this is a, an old railroad corridor. So we're taking existing and reliable available data sources and then inventorying what is known and the results of that inventory are going to guide us in the decision making process in selecting the preferred alternative. And this will be documented in the final uh, contamination screen evaluation report. And with that, I'm done with uh, the overview of the pd &E study and I'll hand it back over to Victor who will do a very excellent job taking everyone through what Ludlam Trail could eventually evolve into once we get past uh, uh, the approval of the pd &E study. Victor? Marty Pete wins the Good Sport Award. He drew the short straw and uh, took the, um, the thankless task of reading those legally required things that have to be read into the record. Thank you, Marty, very much for doing that. And I know that was a little bit hard to, to follow. We're going to get now into the visual part of the presentation. So uh, thank you for, for bearing with us on that. And Marty, thank you for going through it so carefully. First, I want to remind everybody about the website, miamiday.gov forward slash Ludlam Trail. You go there and just like you did, you clicked on that blue button to register. Uh, by tomorrow, you'll be able to go there and uh, click and find uh, under the events tab. Let me just show you what that looks like. Uh, on the bottom of your screen, you see where we have the little green arrow there. On the events tab, you can uh, look for this event, the public information meeting, and all of the exhibits and facts and filings and drawings and renderings and so on are all going to be there. So you can take a look. Now, more importantly, there will be a survey and it will mimic in some way some of the questions we're going to ask you on the poll, but there will be new questions. So even if you answer our smartphone poll tonight, we also want you to go to the website starting tomorrow and fill out that survey. It won't take you but a few minutes. So with that said, uh, let's do a, the first of two quick polls. And for those who just joined us, looks like we have a few people who did just that. Uh, what you'll do is you'll send a text message. The recipient of that text message is the number 
2233. You send your text message to the number 22333. The message you need to send to get into the poll is in the middle of your screen in yellow and black, Dover Coal 516. D-O-V-E-R-K-O-H-L 516. You send that message, and you'll get a response that says, okay, now you're in the poll. This information that I'm telling you will also be pasted into the chat by Brenda Diaz, uh, who is uh, operating the poll for us. So with that, uh, Brenda, if you'll uh, bring up your screen and we'll take a look at the first question. Now for everybody involved, don't rush this. We're gonna take the first question nice and slow so that everybody gets a chance to see how this technology works and is sure to have a chance to answer. This is a question where it's multiple choice answers and you get to answer all that apply. So if you would like to answer with more than one of the choices, you send a separate message for each of them. So we're asking what best describes your interest in the Ludlam Trail? Text all that apply. If you want to walk, ride a bike or run on the Ludlam Trail, the answer would be A. And you send a text message, just the letter A, to that number at the top of your screen, 22333. If you're interested in upgrading parks and, and protecting green space, you can send the message uh, with the letter B, or you can do first one and then the other, separate messages for each answer. If you live in the area near Ludlam Trail, uh, send us a message that lets us know that so we can get to know who's in our audience, uh, the, that'll be the C. If you work or go to school near the Ludlam Trail, uh, then you answer with D. And that could include workplaces in downtown Kendall or in Waterford or Blue Lagoon. It could include, or along 8th Street, it could include schools like, like Coral Terrace or West Miami Elementary Schools or South Miami K through 8 or South Miami Middle School or South Miami High School. Uh, all of those would uh, qualify there. Now, if you own a property that is adjacent to the Ludlam Trail, we'd like you to send us a message with the letter E. Um, and this will let us know how some of the answers we got back tonight might vary between the points of view of people who live right next to this trail and the points of view of people who live a block or 10 blocks or uh, miles away. So uh, your answer to this question will help us understand the results on other questions later on. If you have some other interest in the Ludlam Trail, F, you can send that in. And so as more people are sending their messages and the system is counting them up, the bars are growing and shrinking with higher and, and smaller percentages. And I'm just letting this play here for a little while while uh, to see when it stabilizes, meaning everybody's had a chance to send a message. So the question we're trying to find out is why you came tonight. Everybody has some interest in the Ludlam Trail. Uh, it might be because you're an advocate or a walker, runner, biker uh, for those ways of moving around. Might be because of parks. Might be because you live in an area or live immediately adjacent. Uh, go to school or work near here. So I'm, I'm seeing now that the answers are starting to balance out. Uh, probably most people have had a chance to send their first message. Brenda, before you go go on, I want to see, are you and Alvaro helping anybody who's having troubleshooting issues in the using the chat? Yes, we have Alvaro and Kenneth working with those that right. have issues. If you do have any issues, please um, let us know in the chat and we will help you through it. All right. So um, I told you we'd take our time on the first one. So everything, everyone had a chance to go and I'm, I, the numbers are changing a little bit every few seconds. So mm -hmm. that means more and more people are submitting answers, improving our answers. Now, the, the, the several hundred of you who selected yourselves to volunteer time and come to this meeting tonight and to, and to sit through our reading of uh, difficult legalese slides and our description of all the technical acronyms and all that. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> but uh, you are also a, a small sample, not a scientific sample of the community as a whole. So we ask these questions and these polls partly just to have to facilitate a better conversation. We know more about who's here. But we also realize that those of you who gave up time to attend tonight are more likely to attend later on. We have that public hearing or other important public meetings. You know, there's been no shortage of volunteerism and not-for-profit not organizations who have worked hard to support Ludlam Trail. Uh, for example, Friends of the Ludlam Trail, uh, Maria Nardi and I were talking earlier today, had it not been for Friends of the Ludlam Trail, there, we wouldn't be doing this project. The Friends of the Ludlam Trail spoke up and, uh, and, and, and led and got people involved and aware of the possibilities here and deserve a real shout out for that and have a continued ongoing role in making this successful. 
also the Rails to Trails Conservancy, which specializes all over the country in projects just like this one, where former rail lines become trails. Ken Bryan and the team at the Rails to Trails Conservancy also gets a shout out because uh, they showed us how it's done. They, they uh, brought the community up to speed on how peer communities around the nation and around the state have done exactly what is being attempted here. So um, Brenda, I think we've stabilized our poll results on question one. When you're ready, we'll go to the next one. Now, this one should be pretty fast, just one answer. And what we wanna know is where is your zip code? Um, just type your zip code in and send a message. It's to one of that same recipient, 22333. And as the numbers come in, uh, more, they'll pile up on the screen here in this word cloud. The ones that appear biggest are the ones that we're hearing the most often. So for example, 33143 and 33155, predictably the most people so far have come from those two zip codes uh, because those are right up along the trail uh, in nearby neighborhoods. So we'll give you a few minutes to type in your zip code and send it in. The word cloud will continue growing and changing shape. Uh, and again, the more times we hear it, the bigger and bolder it will be on the screen. Isn't this cool? Um, immediate feedback, <laughs> Maria. Um, instead of instead of waiting for people to fill out paper surveys and count them all up. So I'm getting two things from this as I look at the results that have come in here. First, uh, a lot of people who live or work or own property very close to the trail are participating tonight. Also. Lots of people from other parts of our county are participating, and that's good too, because this is this is really meant to be for everyone. So we'll give this just a second more to dot, to uh, settle down. And Brenda, when you're ready, when you start to see the results slow, um, you go ahead when you're ready. Now, people think about Ludlam Trail differently depending on who they are and, and uh, what age group they belong to. So, uh, tell us your age can just tell us A, if you're younger than 18, B, if you're within between the ages of 19 and 35, C, if you're between 36 and 50, looks like we have a lot of people in that category, and D, if you're between 51 and 65, and E, if it's over 65. And for all, all participants, this, this part of the poll is anonymous. <laughs> we won't really know if you told us the truth here. Um, and um, there, are, there are no birthday candles to blow out, so uh, be as honest as you care to be. I, I, I get from this uh, result we can see on the screen so far a couple of things, Maria. One is uh, that we have a, a wide ranging uh, participation tonight from across the spectrum of age groups. And we have more people in the middle, um, uh, including uh, people who are just beginning their status as uh, senior citizens or GOCO retirees and those who are already uh, in it. We have a small, uh, but noticeable participation uh, from youth. And uh, not surprisingly, we have fewer participants in that 19 to 35 group where lots of people are uh, looking after kids who are homeschooling right now or uh, working two jobs and so on. What I would say to you as you, see, as you see the poll result with me is that no matter which of these groups you belong to, try to think about how the others would see the project we're, just, we're looking at together tonight. And Brenda, when you begin to see the results have slowed down and most people have had a chance to answer, you can, you can push us right on. I think it's ready. All right. Okay, now we're gonna come back and do another poll, a far more important one later on, but we'll be able to cross-reference the results between how you answer the questions that come up later. Uh, looks like uh, Zoom quit unexpected. This is Jen King. I think we're experiencing some technical difficulties. Please bear with us. Okay. Hi.
Hi, Barbara, do you have the slideshow ready for to present in case Victor doesn't? I do, and I'm, I'm queued up. Okay. I think it's, um, if you want to go ahead and start presenting. Sure. And then Victor, he when he rejoins us, we can resume the presentation. Thank you. While we're waiting for technical difficulties to get resolved, I'm just going to take a moment to encourage everybody to not only put questions in the question and answer, but as when we get to the end of the presentation and we begin to answer some of those questions, you may also use the raise hand feature at that time. So if you're not comfortable with necessarily typing your questions in, by all means, feel free to raise your hand and we will uh, also allow questions that direction once we get to the end of the presentation, which will hopefully start here again in just a moment. Thank you. Can you see my screen? No, Victor has taken over. All right, I'm back, I'm and back in. And back. I think, uh, thank you, Barbara, for catching the screen share when uh, Zoom stopped unexpectedly there. Zoom life, well, a lot of us are living it and it does occasionally happen. So uh, Barbara, break in and give me an indication whether we're, you're, you're clearly seeing, hearing me, and you can see what I'm screen sharing. I am clearly seeing you and hearing you, and I see your screen. And I have my screen queued up in case yours drops again. All right, great. Uh, thank you all, and I appreciate your patience. I, I just want to just briefly remind people, in addition to all those technicalities you heard about before, there's a big overriding vision for the trail that is very important. And that is that it will serve many purposes. It is uh, here for uh, those who will be moving about on, uh, say, two feet. That's those who are walking and, uh, and those who are running, uh, using this in incredible location as a place to go out and get their fitness run or their training for the marathon done, that kind of thing. It will also be there for people who are moving about on two wheels. And they might be also taking a fitness ride and just enjoying the the, the, the weather on a, on a cool winter morning, or, or they might be making a purposeful trip, trying to get to work or get to school. Remember the many destinations that are connected by the Ludlam Trail. Now, we'll also be, that'll be here for people of all ages and abilities, and that in, will include those in wheelchairs, uh, those who are sight impaired. And so as we're looking at the design of the trail, we're thinking about all of these users simultaneously. Now, in addition to the, the user group, the vision for the trail thinks about the many kinds of experiences you'll have here. Um, that you will be able to experience uh, unique landscapes that come from planting native plants, trees uh, in our community. You'll be interacting with bustling and busy parts of the city and tranquil and quiet parts of the city, connecting parks and open spaces. We boiled that down into a kind of thesis statement. Uh, the Love Them Trails envisioned to be a 5.6 mile iconic corridor. And I think that captures it, a linear commons, a greenway trail. It is a transportation facility, but it will also be uh, an important public space um, in the same way that a park or street or plaza would be. And it, it, it crosses a huge swath of the county and connects destinations. I spoke earlier about how it's a key component in what we call the Miami Loop. That's the combo of the Ludlam Trail on the west, the, the underline or empath, which is part of the National East Coast Greenway that goes from Key West to the Canadian border and beyond, plus the Miami River Greenway and the future perimeter trail together they come to make a loop. And it's a spectacularly important component of that because of where it is. It runs not through uh, fancy uh, places with uh, skyscrapers and glass buildings. It does, uh, or views of the of the beach, but through ordinary workaday neighborhoods uh, inland, in, in parts of the community that uh, are not well connected, period, but especially not well connected if you are trying to move about in a non-motorized way. So here's that green line that Marty showed on an earlier map and where it stretches across. And now we've superimposed it on an aerial photograph. And again, Barbara, break in and tell me if the, la if the lag is too long here. Uh, we call this our context map, and what you discover when you look at it is that this will link to, together people from all kinds of backgrounds uh, in remarkably different parts of the county. Now, if it was a street, it would more or less be 69th or 70th Avenue-ish, 
Um, so between 72nd Avenue toward the west and 67th Avenue to the east. And it's not a street, it was a railroad and it crosses east-west streets. So there are a few key crossings, which we'll talk about in a, few mo in a, in a moment. Those are from down at 80th Street, and Sunset Drive, Miller Road, Bird Road, Coralway, 8th Street, Flagler Street, and ultimately it will end just uh, for now, just near the old, uh, under overpass of Northwest 7th Street. Now, why is that important? That's important because this line connects a lot of communities uh, from downtown Kendall and South Miami, Coral Gables, Westchester, wa the waterway is right on the trail, West Miami and at the north end of the city of Miami and more. And so these are neighborhoods, which normally we think of driving in between them. The old, uh, should the Love Them Trail be implemented soon enough, you'd be able to take a bike ride from one to another. And along the way, it connects some unique destinations, those schools that I mentioned before, uh, plus Palmer Park, Eddie Barnes Park, Robert King High Park are along the way. And at the southern end, a key connection to transit on the Metro Rail Corridor. And on the, as you go toward the north, the Flagler Street Corridor, one of the so-called smart plan uh, corridors. And ultimately, perhaps the east-west corridor for the even, nor even further north. Now, earlier tonight, I, I reminded people that parts of the trail were purchased by Miami-Dade County uh, Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Department. And those are shown here in the bright green color. They bought the land. It's our, uh, we as the taxpayers own that land. And they, there are other parts, the short development nodes, about 15% of the total here, uh, that remain in private hands. Those are owned by private developers. They're building buildings, uh, including housing and, uh, and uh, shops and restaurants and those kinds of activities in those locations. And they are responsible in their section uh, in the development nodes for building the trail through them according to county standards and with county approval. So the county on the land it did not buy purchased an easement for the trail of a minimum width and uh, an agreement with the, each of the developers for how bridges will connect over the streets that need those and who will build what. So those are part subject to separate agreements. The, the, this is a little complication, but it's worth explaining. The PD&E study, this, this uh, planning activity that we're doing right now, uh, is, is of course largely focused on the green segments here. And what it says about the, the white segments, the so-called development nodes, is pretty simple. If for any reason, the developers uh, that own those private properties seen here with number one, two, and three, uh, don't execute, they don't fulfill their uh, requirement to, con to connect and build and connect the trail. Uh, the county has the ability to go in and do it. And uh, we call that plan B because that's obviously not the way all of us expect it to work out. But for the purposes of the federal requirements and the, uh, the engineering and environmental studies here, we have to, uh, have to anticipate the, the possibility, however remote. So that's plan B, if you will. And so when you look through the drawings, you're gonna see uh, parts of it that are in these green segments that are illustrated in great detail um, and parts of it that are illustrated uh, simply in the nodes uh, for that plan B. And I'm sure there'll be questions about all that and we'll, we will get to those uh, shortly with the panel. Now, as the trail goes along, there are 11 places where it will cross an east-west street uh, or come and touch one if you include 80th Street. And so uh, for each of these, a, a proposed treatment has been envisioned. That doesn't mean it's all finally decided or that permission has been given for these signals and things. Uh, you'll see here on the chart, there are things uh, like the so-called RRFBs. Those are the, another acronym for you. Rapid, rectangular rapid flashing beacons. You've seen those before where there's a pedestrian crosswalk in between two regular intersections. And when it flashes, you as a motorist stop and let the pedestrian go across. Pedestrian hybrid beacons are, are more like a traditional traffic signal where someone has pressed a button or tripped a sensor and traffic comes to a full stop. And, and they, there's a, um, a red phase for the motorists and a you can go phase for the people on bikes and on foot. So where we need to cross that grade, these locations are for the most part, the, the smaller streets. Uh, and we'll look at examples for how this might be designed. In addition to those 11 places where we'll cross 
on the ground surf on the ground level, there are four places where it's envisioned that there will be the, the trail will be rising up and going across a bridge and back down again on the other side. And those are from north to south, Flagler Street, 8th Street, 24th Street, and 40th Street. And, um, and in each of these locations, the, you can see the jurisdiction varies uh, and who does what and how it's coupled with those development nodes varies as well. That's not all the bridges. There are two more bridges <laughs> because for those who know the trail, it crosses waterways two places. One of them is in the waterways neighborhood, the Coral Gables Canal, which has, also has, according to the Water Management District, the poetic name C3, and the Tamiami Canal, which is up at Robert King High Park, or C4. So in pulling together the work that you see, uh, and, and, and all of those previous studies and the, the big listening campaign that took place through the county charrettes, uh, we were also thinking about the peer communities that have done something similar, and mm -hmm. they have been game changers for those communities. Uh, one of them is the Atlanta Beltline. In fact, Commissioner Sosa made a special trip along with uh, local other local leaders to uh, take a look at the Atlanta Beltline and see how it how it was done, how they took an old rail line or old rail lines and combined them into uh, what will eventually be a loop that goes around the city. And they were able to see how private development in certain places was connected to and facing on the, the trail. Um, also, they can see just how popular it is. The Atlanta Beltline has been re remarkably popular. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are many other trails that give us instructions, and they don't all occur in big cities with tall buildings. For example, the Mallard Creek Greenway uh, up in North Carolina is in suburbia. It goes behind single family detached houses and, um, and past uh, university campuses and things like that. And, and for the most part, it's in a green and tranquil corridor. Other, other example trails uh, do combinations of the two, including the Razorback Greenway, which we had a, a hand in getting started. Now it's grown to 43 or so miles uh, near the small towns of uh, Bentonville and uh, the medium-sized town of Fayetteville. Arkansas. I'll just mention a couple from here in Florida, the Katy Way, which is in many ways similar to what we have here. They discovered eventually that everywhere they could, they needed a separate bikeway from the place for walking and running so that the people walking a dog with a leash or pushing a stroller weren't constantly getting tangled up with those who were trying to go by on a bike. Uh, they also have some small and simple shelters in places. I'll talk more about that shortly. The Katy Way and the uh, West Orange Trail have changed the way developers respond to the adjacent real estate. In fact, uh, here's a, a, a residential area where uh, as houses began to fill in or be, uh, and, and be constructed, they faced them on the West Orange Trail. It's not a street in the middle of your picture, that's the trail. Uh, and people sit on those front porches and watch the world go by. And I'm mentioning this example because uh, those trails have, have had remarkable positive economic benefits. And in addition to the study that I already pointed you to, there's one more here, a complicated link there at the bottom, bottom right of your screen. We you wanna go back to the recording and get this link and check out that economic analysis. It basically says these investments, while they're large, can be really worth it for communities that carry them out. And making the investment and in planning is itself a, a, an important way to let funding flow. And they found that, for example, in the West Ashley Greenway in Charleston, which we worked on because their planning, like we're doing here tonight, unlocked major federal funding for key components of it uh, not very long thereafter. And we're gonna get into some pictures now and I wanted to explain what we mean, and you've seen it in the agenda, by 15%. 100% uh, would be a full set of blueprints, the construction documents that you would use to go out and pull per permits and, and start construction. Uh, and we are just at 15%. Now this is the important foundation upon which many other things will be uh, figured out. But it does mean that there's a really long time left during which all the designs will be refined and more detail will be added and the construction plans will be created. So it's not too late to make new suggestions or to point out something that uh, all of us might have missed or uh, raise the bar on ambitions for the trail. The preliminary concept plans, as we call it, are just 15%. And by midsummer of next year, we should hope to be around 30%. And that means there's a lot of time here, but this period is crucial. 
Now, 15% drawings, as engineers typically do them, look kind of like this. Uh, they're in really important and they're jam packed with valuable information. But for most people, they're a little hard to understand. You might not be able to tell from the black and white drawing, for example, what's paved and what's not paved unless you're looking really closely. So what we have done is we've taken these drawings and we've created a much more user-friendly illustrative plan. There's a link on the county website where you can click on it and then look around your part of the trail, interactive map. We'll talk more about that in a moment. So what you're seeing here is where, you know, the, the green parts are where uh, it's planting and the, the pinkish color we've used to indicate where the, the bike path would go. Uh, you can see just separated from it, the, the walking and, and running path. So in the world, what something like that could look like is uh, like this. We have a, we've built to go with these plans a, an ever de more detailed computer model, which we can use as a design tool to look around at the scenes that these acts of construction and planting and landscape architecture will eventually create. So what you're seeing right here is a, an example uh, from um, uh, up near 16th Street of um, hardwood trees providing shade and a separated uh, walking and running path you see here on the left. And over to the right of your screen, you can see uh, somebody uh, going by on the bike path. So this is an example of where the two have been separated a little bit like you saw in the preceding map. Now in places like this, uh, it immediately comes to mind, well, we need to think about what this will be like uh, as the sun sets and before the sun rises. And so uh, lighting is assumed to be an important part of this, probably solar or solar assisted lighting that uh, lets the electrical grid kick in when the batteries are, are down, for example, that's the kind of lighting. And for the purposes of illustrations, we showed low level lighting, not aiming up into the sky and not aiming into the neighbor's houses, but illuminating the path and what you need for safety. There would occasionally be places where it's necessary to put a light on a pole to get more general illumination, but not very much. Most of the idea is to keep the lighting very low. So I'm just zooming in on that a little bit to give you an idea uh, what that can look like. Now, we won't always be moving along the surface. There's an opportunity in a few places for signature bridges to be constructed and allow you to go up and over streets. So here's uh, our artist rendition of what it could be like at Flagler Street. So you see the trail going over, over the street, um, but you also see just under it in the, um, in the background of that picture, the entrance to Robert King High Park. This is the kind of path you would take to go over Flagler and then descend into down toward Lake Mahar on the north end of the Loveland Trail and Robert King High Park just beyond. Now, while we're up in the air, we'll also uh, come down some and then go across the, the uh, Tamiami Canal. So in this picture, we've now turned around the camera and we're looking south and you can see that uh, there's a portion of this bridge structure that would go over the canal and then it would come back down to grade. And in the distance, you can see the, the uh, route over the top of the flag of Flagler Street. So these crossings are very important. I, I showed you a generic section of the trail, uh, but let's talk about what happens when we meet an intersecting street. Uh, here again, the engineering drawings and here the illustrative plan. And what we're showing you here is um, the bike path and the pedestrian path, which have been separated more, uh, come closer together to make a, a crossing. And then in our computer model, We've been thinking about all the other elements, the high visibility crosswalks, the, the planting of the trees, where there's, there's potential for making uh, green rooms uh, along the path of the trail. And when we put all that in perspective, the, the, the line drawings, the, the drafting by itself, not very instructive, but when we look at it through the computer model, we can actually see what these crossings could be like. And so here's a, a what if for a typical crossing. The example is 16th Street, um, and what you're seeing is uh, the, the bikeway and the pedway have now come up next to each other, although separated with a little bit of space for planting and all kinds of safety elements, uh, including a, a leaning rail uh, for the person on a bike that's waiting to cross, a, uh, a push button for activating the signal if it hasn't been tripped by a sensor, um, a redesign of the intersection itself so that cars must slow down. We're not just going to ask them nicely. We're going to redesign the road so that that's the, it feels natural to do so. And that's where you see that little island of planting in the middle. 
Uh, and you also, if you look closely, you notice a pole and some signals that are spanning over the street. This is one of those so-called pedestrian hybrid beacons that you saw in the chart. I'll just zoom in on it a little bit so you can get the idea of uh, making the crosswalks really noticeable, a key part of keeping this safe. So that's a, a crossing as it would, might appear down on the ground, but then there are also the trees. And uh, there's a design idea here uh, that has come up again and again over the years that's visualized now. And that is the, uh, that the crossings are places for uh, of signature importance. We're trying to make them very visible. So in that interactive map on the website, you can actually go on your laptop or on your uh, PC or on your smartphone or on your tablet. And just like you would do with Google Maps, you can pinch in on your phone and zoom in on the intersection that's most interesting to you or scroll along the trail and find your house or your business or your apartment and see what the current thinking is about how the trail would interact with the life you live in that particular neighborhood. So this is an usual and special tool, but for something 5.6 miles long, we needed to give you a way to get involved with it close up. So um, what would you find along the way? In some of the places, we would expect there to be hardwood trees and that, would, that can throw canopy uh, over, the, over the walkway and bikeway and allow for shade. And that would have uh, root barriers, of course, to protect the trail uh, on the sides. So here's an example where you can see after having crossed the street, the, the bikeway and the walking path are together and then they can start to part. Uh, and this particular section illustrates a, a formal planting of trees, like imagine uh, oak trees or gumbo limbos. So when we look at that in cross section, uh, here are the basic components that Marty showed you in the technical section a little while ago. I'm just gonna walk you from the center out. In this particular example, it's the condition where the bikeway and bike path and the pedestrian path are operating side by side. And then you can see just off to the side of those, uh, a little silver vertical line there, that's our symbol for the root barrier. That's all important. It keeps the roots of the joining trees from pushing up the trail and making it unsafe or hard to ride on. That's not a detail to leave out for uh, cost savings, as has been learned so many times on other trails uh, around our county and our state. If you leave out the root barrier, you're gonna be making a lot of repairs and it's not gonna be as fun to use a trail. So we're drawing that in right from the beginning. And here you see those kind of canopy trees. Now on the outside edges of this cross section, on the far left and the far right, uh, you see a note that says minimum 15 foot landscape buffer. And that's since required in a lot of places along the trail, anywhere there's a single family house lot or a duplex lot, uh, it's been agreed that there would be at, at the minimum 15 feet of landscape buffer on the edge. No big construction takes place in that, just plantings. And, uh, and so as a result, in the picture you saw a moment ago, uh, the bikeway and the walkway are generally speaking toward the middle of the 100 feet of width that we have to work with. So now I'll show you another cross section. And just for fun, we've illustrated this one with pine trees instead of uh, oak trees, just to give you the idea that it won't all have to be the same thing. And here, the, the bike path uh, in the middle is separated from the pedestrian path by a planting area in between. There's room for, for drainage and, uh, and so on. That same thing, the illustration of the 15 foot minimum buffer on the sides. There's another thing you'll notice, it says um, uh, clean fill. The, where the, the uh, trail requires remediation of contaminants, uh, that has to be uh, worked and then uh, sealed or covered with a special fabric that's high visibility. So you know if you're ever cutting through it and then a foot minimum of clean fill above it. And that, uh, that will form the new layer on top. This is to protect everybody from whatever contaminants the railroad left behind all those years ago. Uh, so here's another illustration of those kinds of environments. You see the walkway and the pedway, uh, as, we, as we call it for short, uh, separated. You see the landscaped area next to the neighbor's fences. Um, and here in the illustration, pine trees. Now, lots of people have asked about, hey, can we have pine rockland or uh, pines? like the, uh, the native beautiful pine stands uh, in the Ludlam Trail. And the working hypothesis is that we can, but we won't have just that. And there are a couple of key reasons why. It's difficult to grow and maintain. And um, 
and, and better suited to things where you have a lot of contiguous acres, not something just 100 feet wide. It also, more importantly, lets in a ton of sunshine, which is part of why it's beautiful, but also means it'll be very hot. So if you've ever ridden a bike through Larry and Penny Thompson Park, you know what I mean. Uh, so as a result, we, we would think that we'll have some of this landscape, but not too much of it, just enough. And then we can go back to the hardwood hammocks and, uh, and shade trees that uh, like to grow in this area as well. So here's an example of one of those crossings. So we saw a hardwood environment, we saw a pineland environment, and then there are the crossings that are played up for extra attention and landscaping uh, in our vision. There will also be uh, occasional places uh, where there should be a shelter. And if you th go through the illustrative plan, there are a few key places where we know we want one that says shelter on the label. And then there are other places where it says possible shelter and we're seeking feedback about those. Um, now, uh, this example here uh, could be in any of several locations, but for example, near South Miami High School. So you can imagine the cross country coach gathering the team here before they go out for, for, uh, for a training run. Those are locations where you could fill a water bottle or uh, take a minor bike repair, get some water for your dog, see some public art. But most importantly, they'd be places where you can seek refuge from our sudden and short storms. So if we have a little rain shower, you can just stop here, uh, wait when the sun comes out, and can continue on your walk or your run or your, or your ride with dry clothes. Uh, these spaces are very important, but we need feedback on them. And the visual here indicates a kind of architectural approach to it uh, that is in, in line with, say, uh, the heritage parks like Matheson Hammock or, um, or Amelia Earhart Park and other historical uh, beloved parks in Miami-Dade County. Uh, we'll just uh, say last, uh, this minimum amount of architecture here doesn't include anything with a door. Peter Rabino from Friends of the Loveland Trail famously said, nothing with a door. And so we heard that loud and clear and incorporated it here. There are no bathrooms, for example, illustrated in these green segments. And that's because there are already bathrooms at Eddie Barnes Park and Robert King High Park. And there will be, there will be bathrooms available at the development nodes. So we don't need to replicate that in the other sections. Um, but we do need a place to occasionally get out of the rain. Now, for those who are interested in the landscape architecture part of it, there's lots more to say, but I'll just summarize to say that for each of the environments that we've described, like the crossings, uh, like the hardwood hammocks um, and LA's, like the pine land, uh, like the special moments where there's public art or clearings, uh, we've started to assemble a, a preliminary palette of planting materials and architectural elements and how those might look. And that is your look at the visuals, the what if, uh, should um, should we find ourselves um, at the end of this PD&E study told to go ahead, uh, build, realize the Ludlum Trail, and not the no-build alternative? And I want to remind everybody about the about the um, website. Go back there to take a survey, look at the maps, and let's do poll number two. Now we're going to find out what you think about what we've shown you. I also want to throw out a welcome at this point uh, as Brenda is changing the screen to our elected officials and their representatives that are in attendance. Thank you for being here. And if any of you need to raise your hand and uh, request to unmute to say hello, you're welcome to do that at any time. Um, Brenda and Barbara, watch that for me and make sure I don't miss it. So remember you send a text message to 22333. If you're already in the poll, you're still in the poll. Uh, if you just joined us, you have to send a preliminary message first over call 516. Now we want you to answer with just one word, now just one, um, in one word, what is your top priority for implementation of the Ludlam Trail? Um, you send, you type that in, send the text message, and it will start accumulating in this word cloud. We're going to give this a little time so we can uh, see the full range of things that think people think are important. Safety and quality seem to be really high so far. The way the word cloud works, just to remind you, is the more often somebody says something, the bigger and bolder it will appear in the word cloud. Uh, I see continuity popping up, nature popping up as an important one. Uh, so as more and more people send messages to the system, it will keep adding them to this growing word cloud. Um, I think we can already tell safety's on everybody's minds. Um, and think about what the many kinds of safety there are here. Sa safety for the neighbors, safety for 
the users of the trail, safety for those crossing in traffic, safety for those who are out after dark. Um, and uh, interestingly, nature is the next biggest word popping up here so far. So this is a way of taking hundreds of you and getting a glimpse of what's on your mind all at the same time. But uh, we'll, we'll cut this off shortly so that we can go to the remaining questions. Brenda, when you think it's stabilized and uh, people have had a chance to send their most important priority in one word, we'll, um, we'll go on there. OK, it's ready. All right. Now, uh, let's ask the question about the shelters. This is uh, a simple one. You can say A for love it, B for no opinion, C for it needs some work. And we uh, we want to check back in because we know this has always always been much discussed on the Lalum Trail. Do you like this idea of a limited number of shelters along the trail? And for the picture that we put here with this poll, we showed it to you half in sunlight, half in, in, uh, in, in rain, uh, just to remind everybody what it's really all about. Okay, looks like a lot of people are having a chance to to um, answer. I'm watching the numbers move a little bit, and then when they when they stop moving, we're going to go on to the next question. Brenda, you say when you think of the, the responses have stabilized, we'll go on. Okay. Now we showed we showed uh, trail crossings with the idea of, of of really upping the landscape, the gardening, the planting, using trees that would draw attention to themselves, and the high visibility crosswalks. Uh, the uh, parting of the travel lanes for the motorists so they have to slow down the signalization like the pedestrian hybrid beacons. A for love it, B for no opinion, or C for this needs work. Okay. okay. Yeah, so, um, um, uh, seems like it's settling out there. All right. When you're ready, you can go to the next question. Now we want to know about those who are participating tonight how they see themselves using it. So the question is, how likely are you and members of your household to use the proposed trail? A for very likely, B for I'm not sure, and C for it's not likely that I would use it or members of my household would use it. Well, I can tell from the number we see there so far that a large number of those in attendance visualize themselves being on the trail someday in the future. So that's good to know. Okay, I'm going to go to the next one. All right. Now, this is the big question. We've showed you a lot of things. There's a long way to go yet, but we want to see if you think the work is being done so far is generally on the right track. Um, and so, if you think the, it probably is, then say, uh, then send a message with the letter A. You think it might be, maybe, then B. And if it's probably not on the right track, send a message C. So what we're looking for here is not a definitive and final answer. And there are many things we have yet to figure out, uh, but we wanna see if what you saw tonight you think is generally on the right track. For, uh, for all the people who've been uh, burning the midnight oil and working really hard over the last several months to get this together to show you, I, I think this is a reassuring response. Thank you very much for, uh, uh, looks like 97%, uh, 98% said, uh, yes, or maybe, which is remarkable and, uh, and, and good to know. Are you ready for me to share again? Yes, it's ready. All right. So, um, you need to get Zoom to give me the share screen. Okay, now we are in the part of the meeting where we're going to get to your questions and answers and um, and turn to our panel. So I'll be turning it over to Jen King. I would like to just ask one more time if there's any uh, additional elected officials or their representatives who have dialed in that would like to be recognized, please just uh, raise your hand let, or send a message in the chat to let uh, the team know that you're there. With that, Jen King, it's your turn. While you're turning you, on your camera, I'll just, I'll remind everybody that there's that 
part that affects you. And uh, all back to you, Jen. I thank you. Uh, nicely done, Victor. Really wonderful presentation, and and this is quite an exciting project to be a part of. Um, so the moment you've all been waiting for. Uh, we are at the question answer portion of the the, the meeting tonight. Um, the wonderful news is that there are 279 attendees right now with 110 questions in our question and answer queue. The bad news is I'm probably not going to be able to get to all of them between now and eight o'clock at the end of the meeting. So I want to just front load this right now by saying thank you for your questions. As, as the team has said many times tonight, they are very important. Uh, that's the heart of the matter here. No one wants to put a project together that, that, that people aren't going to appreciate and, and participate in. You're here appreciating and participating. And we want to hear from you. Um, so we are going to try and get through as many questions as we possibly can. But rest assured, if we do not, uh, we are recording this information. We are collecting your questions. If you type them in and we don't happen to get to them, we'll follow up after the meeting uh, and be able to get back to you after tonight's meeting. So with that, um, I'm not quite sure what happened to my slideshow. If I could have someone bring the slideshow back up, that would be helpful. Uh, Barbara, Barbara is sharing. Just give her just a second to share the screen. Great, yeah. So um, as she's getting back into slide mode there, um, just wanted to reiterate again, uh, typing your questions in the question answer boxes is, is one of the ways to get here, um, as well as being able to raise your hand uh, in the Zoom function at the bottom there, or at the top, I should say, you can, you can raise your hand. Um, and in a moment, we're gonna have a slide here, uh, which I apologize, I haven't memorized, uh, letting the folks who have called in tonight and are working completely on your phone, which is just fine. You also can participate. You're not left out of that message. So just bear with me as we have the slides catch up to me here. I think we're at 113. There you go. So again, uh, you've seen uh, Victor uh, and we're gonna go through what I'd like to do right now, just to uh, give everyone a chance to get familiar with who our, our, our team is. And we, we, we showed the picture earlier, but we'd like to just self-acknowledge. So uh, everybody on the team is going to have an opportunity. You've already heard from Marty and you've already heard from um, Victor and myself. But at this point, I'd like to turn off my camera and mic and just turn it over to the team to walk through and give themselves a brief introduction. So you'll know who's on the panel answering your questions tonight. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us uh, to discuss La Lamb Trail and uh, and the, the progress we're all doing collaboratively uh, for this for this project. My name is Alex Tisholt, and I'm with Miami County Parks, Recreation, and Open Spaces. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Alyssa Turtletop with Miami Dade County Parks, Recreation, and Open Spaces. It's my pleasure to be here tonight, and we're all very excited about the project. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Cherney. I'm a senior ecologist here in Miami with AACOM, and I am the environmental lead uh, on the pd &E study team. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. This is Babu Marabushi with AECOM. I'm one of the senior environmental engineers uh, working on the contamination stuff for this project. We are all excited to have you on the meeting and we'll be glad to answer any questions. Good evening, everybody. My name is Gorky Charpentier. I work with AECOM and I am the lead designer for the 15% 15 concept, 15 concept plans. Saul, if you have an opportunity to turn on your video and unmute and introduce yourself, you're up. Uh, yes, I'm trying to turn on the video, but it uh, the host needs to let me in. Um, here we go. Hey, good evening, good evening, everybody. My name is Saul Perez, and I'm the lead structures engineer on behalf of AECOM, and uh, be happy to answer any questions related to structures. Hi, my name is Barbara Lamb. I'm with Dover Cole and Partners, and I'm an urban designer. And I'm very happy also to be part of this project. 
And I'm Kenneth Garcia. I'm a lead designer with Oracle and Partners as well. Hi, I'm Brenda Diaz. I'm with Dover Cohen Partners. I'm a landscape architect and a um, hostess for tonight. Thank you, everybody. Next slide, please. Uh, oops, back one. Uh, there, there, there we go. So um, again, uh, uh, this is a picture of what you hopefully see on your Zoom window at the bottom there. For those of you who haven't taken the opportunity yet, uh, we have a question and answer screen to please type in. Um, next. Uh, we're going to ask uh, if you are going to raise your hand and, and acknowledge that way to just uh, please speak slowly and clearly. State your name and address and what your interest is. And here's the important part for my phone dial in folks. Um, if you are just using a phone tonight, dial star nine. That will raise your hand and we'll be able to uh, unmute you and have you ask your question using your phone. So with that, I think what we're going to do is have our presentation switch over to the illustrative plan, which uh, has uh, got the rendering. It shows the trail as proposed with our 15% design. It's got it in context so you can see where it is in relation to the neighborhood. Um, and we'll be able to use this tool as we answer your questions. So if you happen to have a question, uh, we will uh, use this if needed to navigate to an area that you have a question about and use it as a tool that way. With that, I'm going to try and open up our Q&A session. And again, please bear with us. Um, there's a lot of questions here, which is so wonderful. And I'm just gonna start at the top, work my way through as many as we can uh, and get to those uh, hands raised in a moment. So the first question we have, uh, Eduardo Gudi is asking about having a horse in his backyard um, and will he be able to continue to do that? So I've got Barbara Lamb who's queued up to answer that question. Sorry, I'm just queuing that they're being answered live. I don't have a horse answer. <laughs> That's going to be the Miami Dade Parks answer. <laughs> gotcha. I'm just queuing that it's been answered live. Alex or Alyssa, if you would be so kind. The uh, the trail currently is uh, envisioned as a uh, multimodal in the sense of uh, pedestrians and uh, and bicycles. Uh, it's the first time we uh, we hear about the the request for equestrian. Uh, that is something that uh, we will uh, bring back to the team and 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 discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, so the next question I have here from and everyone, please forgive me if I butcher butcher your name. Just. I apologize in advance. Uh, Daima Diaz, um, a neighbor to the trail area, and uh, they have a question about privacy and security and accessibility. Um, security questions, which I'm sure is a question that many people have. Um, Alex, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, security for the trail? Definitely. Uh, security is, is, is uh, definitely uh, something we are uh, considering. Uh, so, sorry. And uh, with the, the, the trail uh, right now, uh, we're envisioning that it will be patrol. Uh, it, it, most pro it definitely will have our park patrols uh, uh, patrolling it. Uh, we'll definitely will be reaching out to, uh, to Miami-Dade County Police to, uh, to join us in that effort. The management plan for the trail, uh, it's going to be developed and that's when that, uh, that is going to be considered and detailed how the uh, security operation will be, uh, will be provided. Did that answer the question, uh, Jen, or were, I think there was a couple of more other elements to the questions, correct? Um, I think that you, you, you covered it um, and, I'm, and if it comes back up again with a later question, maybe we'll, we'll circle back. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, a, there's a question from Eduardo Suarez asking about uh, the fences that are out there today and will they be brought down to, uh, I guess, add to the access to the trail? If I could direct that maybe to Gwerky. 
I know we're talking about the fences or to Babu. Well, currently, yeah, thank you, Jen. That's a very good question. Um, we are currently, we are not removing any fences along the corridor that belongs to the private, uh, private owners. The only fences that we are planning to remove will be the ones connected uh, or next to the parks uh, to provide a better access to the parks. But all the fences, I mean, they are right next to the trail. We are not planning to remove those fences. I mean, those are private fences and there is no intention to remove them. I don't know if there's anything else. Uh, maybe another person maybe can add it. I was on mute. Thank you, Gorky. Uh, and Babu, I think at one time we were talking about the fences that have been recently erected, if you wanted to address that portion of the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a great question. And I believe a lot of people are interested in that. That fence was installed by um, where it's not installed by the private property owners. That was installed by Miami-Dade County um, Department of Environmental Resources and Management uh, for safety of the uh, people. So it, it'll stay there until at least the uh, trail work uh, is going to um, happen. After the construction is completed, that'll be reevaluated uh, before they can take down the fence where it's uh, open uh, properties and uh, such areas. Thank does you, that, Babu. Does that uh, answer the question, Jen? Yes. OK. Yes, thank you. At this time, I'm going to switch over to the folks who have patiently had their hands raised. Um, at the top of the queue, I have Esther Sosa. I am going to click a button. It's going to allow you to talk. You get an opportunity to unmute yourself at this point. So Esther Sosa, if you could click that button and uh, ask us your question, please. Hi, uh, yes, I'm going to put my husband because he has the question. Sure, great. Thank you. Uh, hi, hello. I have a question. Um, we wanted to know what's going to happen with the, with the fence line that, that goes from the back of the yard to the what's going to be the, the park trail. Is it going to be pushed back to a certain distance or is it going to all be one whatever that's there? Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm going to direct that one to Alex, if you want to talk a little bit more about the fencing that's out there today. Thank you. Uh, good question. Uh, and I think we've heard that uh, a couple of times uh, in the, uh, the Q&A uh, type uh, questions, what's uh, happening to the, uh, to the uh, fences uh, behind uh, private homes. Uh, th those fences uh, should be in private property. Uh, they're within the uh, uh, the residential homes property. They're not within the, the trail, so therefore we are not going to be uh, affecting uh, those fences. Those fences will be uh, uh, will be remaining. Those are uh, private property fences in, within private property, not the trail. Thank you, Alex. Um, circling back over to the Q&A box, Patrick Florentino is asking how much of what we are looking at here tonight for the Ludlam Trail is funded. Alyssa, if you'd be kind enough, please. Thank you, Jen. Good evening. Uh, as we are in the early stages of design, once the design gets further along and we're able to establish exactly how much um, it will cost to implement the project. We will be able to uh, fully ascertain the, the cost versus the funding, but a, a substantial portion of the project is already funded and most of, of what you're seeing tonight uh, will be able to be implemented. As features get added, then we have to reassess the costs and, and the design. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, Jamie Dukuna is asking about the, the, the pet friendliness of the trail. Victor, if you'd be kind enough to take that question, please. Happy to, thanks, Jen. Um, well, of course, uh, people will want to use the Ludland Trail to walk their dogs, for example. And why do I know that's true? Well, because for years, many of the people in the surrounding neighborhoods have done exactly that. In fact, they were surprised when they, uh, once the contamination was found, they weren't able to keep doing it. And uh, we hear from them all the time. They're very interested in being able to do so. So for example, 
uh, at the areas where we showed places to fill your water bottle, we also illustrated um, uh, the kind of water fountains that will have a place mm -hmm. for uh, people as tall as humans to drink and also um, a, a place to uh, pour water out uh, for your dog and, a, and the dog water fountain. And that was just there in those images as a symbol of the idea that we want people to feel comfortable walking their dogs, you have to follow the rules uh, and they need to keep their dog on a leash and they need to stay off the bikeway uh, when they're walking their dog. But the, the thought is that this is intended to be a trail that welcomes people to, to, uh, uh, to come to, the, to, to it, to get their exercise and get their dog their exercise at the same time. Wonderful. Thank you, Victor. I'm a pet lover myself, so I appreciate that question. Um, another question in our Q&A from Joe Curbeo. I apologize, uh, chairperson of the Citizens Independent Transportation Trust and an avid cyclist, asking a question about mitigation, mitigation for road crossings. So this is the place where the trail is going to cross roadways. Gorky, if you'd be kind enough. Thank you, Jen. For some reason, I cannot get the video. Uh, um, yeah, that's a very good question. We are, we have, uh, like Victor mentioned at the presentation, there are different type of uh, crossings that we have in the, in the project. Um, essentially, what we have is uh, four different type of crossings. One that we call the standard crosswalk, where we have, I mean, the standard crossing that you see in every street that you have a, a crosswalk that is delineated for people to cross. Um, and then uh, we have also there are, we have the that will be the standard crosswalk. We have also the pedestrian hybrid beacon that also Victor mentioned in the in the presentation, where you have a a mast arm with signal heads that will prevent the, the vehicles to cross while pedestrians are crossing. So we will have a pet button that will allow the people to to press the button and uh, allow them to cross the street. So that will be one of the Options that we have in, uh, for these uh, crossings, that's called hybrid beacon. Okay, we have also another one that can be also as an option, which is a rectangular rapid flashing beacon. I mean, and that one will consist of essentially a sign that has some flashing lights that will be actuated by people that want to cross this, want to cross the the, the street. They will press the button, and uh, there will be some signs that will give a advice to the, uh, give a, some warning to the drivers that are some people will be crossing. I mean, that's, a, that's another type of crossing that will also be implemented in, the, in a, depending on the location that will be implemented in the corridor. Um, and uh, those are the type of crossings that we have, I mean, that, that can be implemented. So the, the, the flashing beacon, the, the hybrid beacon, which will have, I mean, also a combination of the two, and also the, the one that has the, the mass tank with a signal head. So depending on the importance of the crossing, we will implement uh, different type of uh, uh, crossings uh, along the corridor. Thank you. Thank you, Victor, uh, <laughs> Corky. Um, and I just wanted to throw out there that uh, as was mentioned earlier, the material you are watching tonight, the, the PowerPoint itself, the, the, the illustrative plan, as well as those engineering black and white plans will all be available on the website after tonight's meeting. So if you have an interest in the details of the crossings for each location, um, you can go to the website, you can see the plans, you can uh, flip to the page and it's black and white PDF. I appreciate that, but it is gonna explain what is being proposed at each individual intersection. And you'll get a little bit better picture um, than just our discussion or the table that's here in front of you. With that, I'm gonna switch over to uh, back to our, our hands raised. Again, thank you for your patience, everybody. I have Maggie Duque. Again, I'm sorry if I messed up your name. I'm allowing you to talk at this point. So if you could please, there we go. If you could please unmute yourself, Maggie. Hi. We'd like to hear your question. Okay, please. hi. Can, sure, hi. can you hear me now? We hi, can. how are you? Thank you so much. I know mm -hmm. you got my name right. Oh. Yeah, I've got a quick question. I'm driving, so I apologize. But I wanted to know how many structures are you planning? Okay, great. We'll answer that question. Um, Saul, our structural uh, expert, will answer that, please. 
Yes, at the moment, uh, and I think uh, uh, Victor already covered it in, in the presentation, but we have uh, a total of six bridges uh, uh, crossing uh, along the uh, along the trail. Uh, four of them over roadways, um, and uh, two of them uh, over uh, waterways uh, or the canals. Uh, I believe it's uh, Canal C3 and C4, and a crossing at uh, Flagler. It's uh, the overhead. Uh, crossings over the roadways would happen at Flagler Street at uh, Tamiami Trail, which is uh, Southwest A Street, uh, Coral Way, which is Southwest 24th Street, and uh, Bird Road, which is Southwest, uh, Southwest uh, 40th Street. Thank you very I, much, Saul. Hey, that, Jen, if I don't mind yes, Victor. Just for a second. I think that question might have also been about the shelters, uh, the, the, the little structures that I illustrated for range shelters. The exact the answer to that is the exact number of those has not been finalized. We have a few we, we know we really need because they're in certain locations. And there are other ones that seem like it'd be a pretty good idea. And we want to have them frequently enough that you can find refuge if you, know, you get out of the storm, that kind of thing. Uh, but when you scroll along the illustrative plan, you'll see some of them are marked shelter and others say possible shelter. And the dif difference there is that on the ones marked possible, we need some feedback. Is that, is that one shown in the right place? Uh, are we right that there probably should be one near, say, South Miami K-8 school? And you'll, you'll see that they are positioned in general where they're not right next to somebody's house. They're either they're right next to a, a street that turns or in a location where they can be more toward the center of the trail. But that's, we need some feedback about that. That's one of the reasons for the interactive map. Victor, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And, and again, we're interpreting your questions. So if hopefully one of those two answers is the right one, I uh, appreciate that. Uh, next question we have up here, and, and Victor, they're asking for you. What are the biggest derailers that the public might need to know about that might delay the progress uh, as the trail moves forward? Well, uh, any project like this, uh, in, in my experience, is is subject to delay uh, for a number of reasons. One is if there is something found that we don't know about now, there'll be a reason not to do this. Uh, it will come to light as a result of all the engineering analysis and so on that we're doing. Um, Remember, it's not a foregone conclusion that the trail will be implemented as shown tonight. Uh, that's just one of the two alternatives that have to be examined in an all important public hearing, the next phase of the PD&E study. Uh, we think that will be in, in March of 2021. And so uh, the exact date hasn't been set, but around March or uh, early April of 2021, there will be a public hearing. And uh, your elected officials and, the, and those conducting that hearing are going to be considering all the if the trail was built and the all of the different impacts positive and and so on that or, and otherwise that it would have and if there's any negative impacts what the offsetting uh, proposals are to mitigate those uh, it looks really good at this point and I think you can see based on the 15 percent information that there are good answers for everything we've identified so far uh, but they'll also be considering the second alternative the no build alternative that's a that and this isn't like a, a new highway or something where you'd be considering different ways of aligning it. There's really only one logical alignment for the Ludlam Trail. So the two alternatives being analyzed and considered in that hearing are the build alternative and the no build alternative. Uh, so uh, yes, it's it's possible that we could start to hear people uh, change their mind. They want this. And that would be a reason for delay. Much more serious, likely uh, reasons for delay could come in the uh, with funding. We need to make sure that we're standing shoulder to shoulder and we're we're communicating the benefits and uh, we're we're looking for return on investment and cost savings and reasonableness in what is proposed. Um, and and we will need to look for funding. As you know, federal money and state money and county money have been spent up to this point. A lot of county money has been spent on the acquisition. The state has been in a big in a big way as investors. The federal government has invested in the in some of the costs for planning and design, um, but there's more to do. And hypothetically, we were thinking that because this is on the Sun Trail priority map for the state, uh, that a logical funding source for construction is state funding. That's going to require consensus among all of us and consensus among the leaders in Tallahassee. So, one of the biggest sources of delay could be delay in putting the money together. 
Thank you, Victor. Appreciate that. And I apologize. I didn't uh, mention that that last comment came in from, I'm sorry if I mess up your name, Alexander Reiki. Um, next question we have up here uh, mentions that um, they're interested in the pathway lighting. I'm just going to go ahead and mention that we are at 15% design, and I don't think we have an answer about light lumens at this time, but please stay engaged in the project as it moves forward, and we will uh, have more detail as it finishes pd &E, moves into final design, then they'll have answers to those kinds of uh, more detailed design questions. Uh, I'm going to take another person who has raised their hand. This one looks like it's a person who's called in. Uh, so I'm going to allow you to talk. Uh, the, the last three digits of your phone number are 594. If you would like to do the star nine, uh, you can unmute yourself and we will hear your question if you'd be so kind. Phone number five, ending in 594. Give you an opportunity there to unmute yourself, which is star nine. Looks like maybe they're having a little challenge with that. We're going to give them a minute and we're going to try the next person while they get queued up. So my next question is Ana Izquierdo. I'm allowing you to talk. If you could please unmute yourself, Ana. We'd love to hear your question tonight. Hi, um, I'm Ana Izquierdo. Thank you for doing this. Um, I'm really interested in the horses on the trail. I know you guys mentioned you're not sure about that, but we, like, I moved to this properly solely because we can have horses in our backyard. And I know a lot of us have been uh, riding our horses on the Ludlum Trail before it closed down. Um, so I'm just wondering if we're going to be able to do that again, um, or if that is going to be, uh, that option is going to be taken away from us. I mean, at least if we can at least zone it to our area, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Appreciate your question. Uh, I believe that we had Alex answer that a little bit earlier. Did you have something you wanted to add on to that, Alex? Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you for the question. Uh, tonight is the first time we, at least I, I personally hear about that, uh, that interest. As, and as I mentioned earlier, we'll uh, bring it up to the table and, and discuss it with, uh, with the team. Thank you. Jen, Thank for our you, next Alex. group of questions, can we, there's a lot of people asking about hours regarding uh, the park hours versus trail hours. Um, so I've got a lot of questions about that, if we could mm -hmm. address that. Great, yes. So um, in terms of the park hours, I think Alyssa, uh, you're from County Parks and have a good uh, perspective on that, if you'd please just go through maybe the hours that we expected open and that question in general. Hi, Jen. Yes, thank you so much for the question. Um, the hours of Ludlam Trail, as all Greenway Trails in Miami-Dade County, would be open 24 hours a day for the purposes of connecting to work, school, home, play, and uh, places of business. And Miami-Dade County Parks, such as A.D. Barnes Park, um, are open from dawn till dusk. But Greenway Trails, such as Ludlam Trail, are open 24 hours a day. Thank you, Alyssa. So I have the unfortunate uh, responsibility of saying that we are two minutes to eight o'clock. So I really appreciate everyone's interest. I apologize. We were not able to get to everyone's questions tonight, um, but please do not feel like this is your last opportunity to get those questions answered. For those of you with hands raised, feel free to go ahead and go to the Q&A and type the question in uh, don't lose that train of thought. We'd love to hear your question. For everybody who's in the q and I have 148 unanswered questions, which is great. I love the participation here. Uh, we're going to get back to you with answers. Just uh, we have your information uh, and we will follow up after the meeting. So with that, I need to switch back over to our, our slide deck. Uh, we just have a few more minutes to wrap up tonight's meeting. Um, There we go. I want to remind folks to go back to the website tomorrow and more material is being added tonight. The recording will be there. More material will be added tomorrow and a survey will be there. And so this is your portal to uh, to give feedback on what you've seen. As we build up more answers to frequently asked questions, we'll post those there. 
Um, and there's, of course, the vis visual exhibits are there and there's going to be a survey that you can fill out. I think some of the questions are questions we've already asked you tonight. This is a smartphone poll, but you can also answer them again. And we want you, even if you answer tonight, to go back and answer the, those, uh, that survey because there are new questions on the survey uh, that on the website that you will be able to answer tomorrow. So miamidade.gov forward slash Ludlum Trail. The big important next step is uh, preparing based on what we've learned tonight and what we learned through the conversation uh, over the next three weeks, we'll be preparing for the public hearing in March. So in between the next 21 days is an official public comment period in which the website is gonna be set up as uh, your way of giving more feedback, asking new questions, prompting and steering the design team toward things we, that, that need more investigation uh, and or things letting us know about what you do like so that we can make sure that those things stay in as we as we do trade-offs and work on more advanced plans. So once we have that public hearing in March, um, we will then by midsummer be at so-called 30% plans. And that this pd &E study should be officially concluded by September of 2021. The steps that follow are the ones that you might imagine, getting all the way to 100% plans. that will take the rest of 2021 and part of 2022 um, so that uh, you're ready to uh, pull permits and, and start construction. Um, at this point, it's an estimate, but we foresee groundbreaking around October 2022 or shortly thereafter. And then um, the remediation of the contaminants is done, followed by the building of the trail, as you've seen it on top. That will take about 36 months. So uh, it will, of course, not all happen at once. It'll be a, a rolling operation uh, down the trail as they go. So those are your next steps. And back to you, Jen. Thank you. Um, if I could have the slide deck, I think, go back one. Website? Uh, contact information. Ah, okay, here we go. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, so to just end tonight, I just want to make sure again that there are multiple ways for you to provide uh, information and input into the pd &E process. Uh, Victor was just talking about our website. Again, it's www.miamida.gov forward slash Ludlam Trail. Uh, if you are not into electronics and like to write us a letter, there's a mailing address there at Miami-Dade County Parks Rec and Open Spaces, 275 Northwest 2nd Street, 4th floor, Miami, Florida, 33128. And then Marty, myself, and the rest of the team are also available. Our phone numbers and email addresses are there. Thank you very much, everybody, tonight. It's been a fantastic meeting. Uh, again, we appreciate all of your input, and we look forward to moving forward. Uh, as everyone talked about, to the next steps of the project for Ludlam Trail. Good evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. And thank you for participating.